Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Cozin. And I'm Tracy McCray. According to the National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, a division of the National Institutes of Health, 36 million Americans have a hearing loss, and it's a growing problem for our pop- as our population ages. Approximately one-third of Americans between ages 65 and 74 have hearing loss, and that number increases to half of all adults over 75. The good news is that hearing aids can help. The bad news? Only 20% of people who could benefit from treatment actually seek help. This lack of treatment often affects the social, physical, and cognitive well-being of older adults. Here to discuss the consequences of untreated hearing loss is the chair of otorhinolaryngology. Did I get it? Well done, Uh, yes. (laughs) Dr. Colin Driscoll, welcome back to the program. Dr. Driscoll, it's nice to see you again. Thank you. I think the the last time you were here, it took me quite a while to get that word, but I got it. Uh, untreated hearing loss, um, I, to me, it seems like the worst part about it is that everybody argues that huh? they can't hear each other. <laughs> is, is it, there has to be more than that. Well, there's probably a little bit more to that. Probably. But, uh, you know, we used to just think hearing loss was a, just a part of aging and you just deal with it and it's, and it's not a big deal. But as, um, as we were starting to learn, there are actually really significant consequences to not hearing. And, you know, as we age as a population, more and more people are falling into that category of having meaningful levels of hearing loss, which impairs their ability to engage in all the daily life activities that they want to. So does everybody lose hearing loss or have hearing loss as they age? Or can you comment on that? Um, You know, there are different statistics out there, but over half of people in their 70s have meaningful amounts of hearing loss, maybe up to 80 percent of people in their 80s. We all lose some degree of hearing loss, but what you need out of your ears does vary person to person. Does age-related hearing loss typically start at a certain age, or is it different for everyone? It definitely differs. Uh, So I think some people are more genetically predisposed to develop hearing loss. And of course, you know, we do things that uh, accelerate our hearing loss, like not wear ear protection. Yeah, I'd also be really curious. Do you think that with all the earbuds and listening things, that that'll be a bigger problem for my generation? Yeah, I think there's uh, good evidence to to say that. On the other hand, also people are really aware uh, of the importance of wearing hearing protection and protecting your ears, Um, you know, if you're around noisy equipment, firearms, uh, even vacuum cleaners and things that blenders that you might think aren't all that loud. But, you know, every one of those exposures might knock off a few more hair cells, and ultimately that all adds up. What are signs and symptoms? I mean, if... if someone that lives in your house is struggling with hearing, the only way that you can know that is if they say, I'm having trouble with hearing. Yeah, a lot of people with the hearing loss don't, aren't the first to recognize sure, it, right? Because it's, it happens it's, so gradually. Right, it's, it's you know, your friends and family who notice that they've been saying something and you didn't respond or you misunderstood what they said. And I think that, you know, those are relatively minor things, but as the hearing loss progresses, um, it, it affects their day-to-day lives. So if you have a hard time hearing, you might start to withdraw from social activities. To you know that going out to dinner, it's just going to be problematic, mm-hmm. and it's a struggle, and it's frustrating, and so you stop doing those things. And that's where the, the bad spiral begins. So what are some of those additional consequences beyond the social or included in the social? Yeah. Um, you know, we used to think of hearing loss as just, again, being this separate thing from our overall health, but there are significant health-related consequences to hearing loss. And there's lots of different ways to look at it, but one of the ways is just to expand on what we were talking about, this social uh, withdrawal. So as you socially withdraw, um, you spend more time at home, maybe you have increased risk of depression, uh, your physical activity isn't as good, so your balance is also getting worse, your overall health condition is getting worse, and um, your eating habits and sleeping, drinking, all those things um, start to get worse. And all those have obvious significant uh, physical consequences. Falls in the elderly is, is an enormous problem. Uh, we all lose balance function over time. We're all at higher risk of falling later on. You think, well, hearing is hearing, but hearing actually helps us stay balanced. But also that, again, that social isolation withdrawal, you don't get out as much, you don't move as much, you gradually, your balance deteriorates even further, and you fall. And so there, there's very good data showing that just the simple fact of having hearing loss increases your risk of hospitalizations, increases your risk of mortality. 
and that's untreated. And, and the really, I think the really interesting thing that is being studied now is, is this a modifiable risk factor? Sure. So, and so if it is, how do we diagnose it? Well, diagnosing it's not hard. Yeah. You get a hearing test, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and that'll show the degree of hearing loss. And then I think the key is if you treat it with hearing aids or cochlear implants, whatever's most appropriate uh, for the degree of hearing loss, or surgery. There's repair, you know, types of hearing loss we can fix with surgery. Then uh, you know, can you avoid some of these other consequences? I think it's really interesting to think about the consequences and using that as a little bit of leverage to kind of get somebody in the door to have the hearing test and then to consider hearing aids. And, you know, kind of think of hearing aids as maybe having a bad rap. And what, um, how has that technology changed and improved over the years that people might be a little bit more sold on it? Yeah, I, it's definitely leverage, I think, yeah. in, in terms of, boy, this is going to not only help me here in my day-to-day life, but makes me healthier long term. Um, Hearing aids, you know, they're like every technology. They keep getting better. They yeah. keep getting get better connected to our phones. Uh, we're much more accustomed to wearing things on our ears all the time. And so these technologies are just getting better integrated. And circuitry and all that kind of stuff does get better. So the performance is truly better. Yeah, it seems so many people need eyeglasses. They'll say, okay, I'll get eyeglasses. They yeah. need a hearing aid, and they can't relate them. And was it because back? 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, hearing aids were so ineffective and so bothersome that it wasn't a fair comparison to make between glasses and hearing aids? It's still not a fair comparison. So the one way to look at it is with hearing, um, with the uh, glasses, the sensory part of the eye, the back part of the eye, where the nerve is, that's okay. And it's, and it's more of a lens problem. And that's a easily fixed structural thing. Whereas hearing aids... Um, have to still work with the whole inner ear and it's the inner ear sensory part that's often deteriorating in people and the hearing aid can amplify sound it can do a lot of interesting sound processing things but it can't fix that internal damage um, so that it, they work differently i have a different kind of hearing loss than age relating hearing loss but i just brought my little hearing aids for those people that might see the video and they're teeny tiny and really mm-hmm. cute mm-hmm. and you can't see them at all and they also bluetooth connect to my phone so i can use it as a if i'm running on my treadmill as a headphone. I think yeah. that so many people now are used to using headphones yeah. and, and earbuds that mm-hmm. when it comes time for hearing aids, I kind of think that people will be more inclined to want to wear hearing aids. Am I off base? What do no, you guess? No, we're definitely seeing that trend yeah. and I, I think it's much more accepted. The other thing is there's you know a relationship between um, cognition and uh, dementia and mm-hmm. hearing loss. And that's received a lot of attention um, for obvious reasons. But again, is hearing loss a modifiable risk factor? And there's multiple ways that hearing loss can be related to cognition. So if you struggle to hear, where is that extra brain power coming from? Mm -hmm. So you're borrowing from somewhere else, some other aspects of your brain, just to be able to hear the words and understand the sentences and, 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 and learn so that there's an extra cognitive load. We also know that if you lose hearing, there's structural changes that happen in our brains. I like to think of my brain as pretty static, yeah. mm-hmm. but it's changing. So if you don't have auditory inputs that are the same, there are physical structural changes that occur. And again, these could be then related to um, cognition. And then uh, we talked about the social isolation and withdrawal and reduced social interaction is another uh, potential pathway of connection. And no, I think there's unanswered questions in this space, and I'm certainly not saying that everybody with hearing loss who you treat is is going to make all the medical things better, but it, there, I think there is a real relationship, and that it is truly a modifiable uh, risk factor mm-hmm. for a lot of things. Are hearing aids covered by insurance or Medicare? Why aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> They're not? No, generally not. So there mm-hmm. are you know some, some uh, uh, coverages here and there, but in general, they're not. And you know, back in the day, nobody really thought. It, I think when uh, looking at Medicare in particular, well, it's just hearing loss. Um, right. mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't have. Again, it's just part of aging. It's accepted, and and really, I think we understand now it's more of a medical condition. And I think they should be covered. I doubt they will be. Yeah. What are some examples of the non-hearing aid solutions, potential surgical options for? 
hearing loss? Yeah, so there's um, hearing loss problems that might be due to an eardrum, you know, hole in the eardrum, or there's those three little bones of hearing, the incus, malleus, and stapes. Um, <laughs> you know, so there could be problems mm-hmm. with those that we can fix. Um, fluid in the ear, uh, tumors or things that are blocking the ear canal. So there are a number of things we can fix there surgically. And then there's several different types of implantable uh, devices that either bypass bad parts of the ear, say you're born without an ear canal, well, we can send a signal through the bone to the inner ear and stimulate it. Or uh, cochlear implants for people who are, are basically outgrowing hearing aids. So they've, you've used hearing aids, you no longer gain uh, enough benefit, uh, you may be a cochlear implant candidate. The uh, consequences are many, and I'm surprised by a few of them. So thank you for sharing them with us today. Absolutely. My pleasure. We've been talking about the importance of treating hearing loss with the chair of otorhinolaryngology. Did I do it right again? (laughs) Uh, You nailed it. (laughs) Dang! Two times in a row, Dr. Colin Driscoll. Thanks again for joining us, Dr. Driscoll. Thank you.